right, so it's 12 o'clock. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, appreciate you tuning in for the Winter Garden Prep, uh, Gardening the Panhandle Live uh, edition for September. So we are closing in on planting that winter winter garden. In fact, before we got started, we were just talking with Matt Orwatt here, one of our panelists, about he's already got started. So with that, uh, again, thanks for being here. We're get, we've got a lot to cover today. So we are going to go ahead and get going. I'm going to introduce all of our panelists. We'll start with Stephen Greer. Stephen, how are you today? Good. How are you doing, Daniel? Good. So y'all tell us uh, what county you're in and what yep. your what your specialty is. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, the county extension director and have a combination kind of leadership development and a touch into horticulture when I need to cover the bases when the horticulture agents are busy. And uh, I'm in Santa Rosa County. Awesome. Love some Santa Rosa County. We'll go just below Stephen on my screen is Mr. Matthew or what? How are you doing today, Matt? Oh, I'm pretty good. I'm very happy to be here and I'm looking forward to my favorite season of the year, the fall time. And that's my favorite gardening season as well. So I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. And to Matt's right, we have Mr. Ray Baudry. Ray, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. That's right. Whether you're in Eastern or Central time zone, <laughs> like if you're in Gulf County, right? That's right. <laughs> uh, that's right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ray Baudry. I'm the county extension director over here in uh, Gulf County. I'm the ag and natural resource agent and uh, part-time horticulture agent, too. How about that? Awesome. Thanks, Ray. And finally, mm -hmm. Ashley. Good afternoon, Ashley. We're officially in the afternoon in the, East, in the central time zone here. So how are you today? I'm doing well, thank you. I am a horticulture extension agent here in Jackson County. All right. So thanks to all of our panelists for logging on today. And we're going to go ahead and get started. We were having some chat issues here for a second. Hopefully we're going to get that fixed. So once we get the chat up and going, um, y'all go ahead and uh, put where you are uh, in the chat so we can see that. We'll uh, let you know when that gets fixed. So apologize for that. Uh, but anyway, we're going to get started with our Zoom questions. Again, we've got like 40 questions. So we're going to try to get through as many of these as we can and get you all the answers you want for your winter garden. So we're going to start with Matthew Orwat. Matt, this is a great question to get started with. This person says, I'm just getting started uh, with my garden. I assume this is the first garden they've ever grown. So what would their first steps be in your mind? Well, I, I put a link there uh, for uh, soil tests. So I think the first thing they should do in their garden location is do a soil test to see what pH they have and see if and what their macronutrient and micronutrient needs are. That would be key. Uh, the soil test does give you some great information about pH and your nutrients, but it doesn't give you all the, the whole picture. You still need to read some um, articles such as the, in the links we provide about fertilization of your vegetable garden. And also you need to make sure your soil has an adequate amount of organic matter and it has been prepared for uh, vegetables um, so that there's the, the soil has some looseness to it and it's not compacted. And the last thing I would say is if you're, if you're gardening an area, make sure it's not, doesn't, it's not full of invasive weeds and you're gonna wanna do something to uh, either kill off or uh, with herbicide or through solarization, removing the existing vegetation in that location so that you're not bombarded with weeds when you plant your vegetables. Uh, solarization is a good alternative to uh, herbicides, but both will work uh, equally well. Yeah, so that's awesome. Yeah, just mm -hmm. making sure you're starting right. It's super important. Get that soil test and make sure your soil's clean as you get going. Matt, we're going to stay with you for this question. Sure. This is one we get a lot of times. Um, and so maybe you can touch on crop rotation here a little bit. Should you have your winter garden in the same place as your summer garden? Is there uh, any advantage or disadvantages to that? What do you think? Well, I think there. the, the question is it depends. Uh, I would say <laughs> there's no disadvantage to having your winter garden in the same place as your summer garden. And there could be certain advantages in that certain plant families will leave nutrients in the soil that your winter vegetables could use especially if instead of throwing away your last year's plants, you might compost them back. Like say you decided to lay back your, your okra or something into the, into the, um, just lay it down on top of the, the winter plants to pr provide them some compost and some extra shade. If you're planting early uh, until they rot, that would be an option. Um, I, I provided a link which shows uh, crop rotation for plant families. So in general, you're going to want to plant uh, your winter crops 
uh, in an area where a different plant family was earlier. So say you had tomatoes in one location and it was in the Solanaceae, and then you planted some broccoli in that location, that's in the Brassicaceae, you'd be perfectly fine with that. But you wouldn't want to plant some maybe a, a early a winter potato crop or something that's also in the Solanaceae where you had tomatoes. Um, but there's plenty of different plant families, so rotation is perfect. And that's fine to plant something, uh, plant your winter vegetables in the same place as your uh, summer garden. And one other thing that I want to touch on, that say, for instance, your summer uh, garden is still producing, like say your peppers are still producing well into October, and you want to plant some winter vegetables in that location, you could also seed out, say, say some radishes or beets, or plant some onions, and you could do some intercropping as well. For sure. Good answer, Matt. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, we're coming straight to you down there in Gulf County. Uh, so this is a great question. So in the fall, would you recommend cleaning out ra their raised beds and starting from scratch? So putting, you know, down cardboard, filling it back with soil, fertilizer, compost, all of that. Should we start fresh every year? Can we reuse that soil and all that good stuff? What's What say you? Really no need to start from scratch unless your bed is super shallow. Um, if it's 18 inches or taller, it wouldn't be a concern um, really um, with removing everything out of the bed and remixing. You'll need to want to uh, dispatch any of the weeds, uh, but at the end of the growing season, you can till in those vegetable plants um, into the beds and then you've got some excellent organic matter there. Um, you can always add some additional compost to it and fertilizer as well. I use a mix of like 50-50 compost to soil as really a general rule there. All right. Awesome. Yeah. I've got 12 inch tall raised beds and I've never totally, you know, I've never pulled it all out and restarted. Um, so you can just kind of keep adding to it as you go, unless you got some kind of major problem like Ray mentioned. So I'm, I'm with, I'm also with Matt on that. Um, as far as the soil test goes, it would be good to have a soil test done every maybe two years. You know, it's, it's uh, pretty cheap. I mean, $10 plus shipping for a soil report. And um, then you can get to, uh, you know, a good, correct, specific fertilizer grade to use for your application there in your home garden. Awesome. So we're going to move over to Ashley. Uh, Ashley, so this Zoom listener has never tried winter gardening before, and they only have a small space, like many of us, uh, small yard, small outdoor area. Can you grow these winter veggies in containers, you know, uh, where, where you're not in the ground, just in a pot or in a raised bed? Absolutely, yes. You can grow um, most any vegetable in a container. You will want to consider if you're doing root vegetables that your container is deep enough for radishes or beets or carrots. But yes, you can definitely do containers. All right, awesome. And we'll, we're going to talk much more about containers as we go, but the short answer is yes. So very good. Yeah. Matt Orwatt, coming back to you. I promise we're going to get to you in a minute, Stephen. You did not sign, sign up for any of these first group of questions, so do that next time. Matt, good places to buy starter plants. What do you okay. recommend? Where do you get your transplants from? Um, just some places that folks may be able to look around the panhandle. I have some interesting comments on this. Okay. Uh -oh. so, <laughs> the first thing is, yes, you can find your starter plants at a myriad of locations. I mean, mm -hmm. you could go to your feed store, your local feed store. Maybe your local nursery has a vegetable garden program where they're, they're starting uh, vegetables from seed. You can go to your big box stores. You can go pretty much uh, everywhere. There's a, there's a good selection of starter plants. You often see a major name brand in a lot of these places that, that has a good reputation. So, you know, you, you have options there. Another, another thing is uh, I, I put a link in there about starting your vegetables from seed because there's a chart, a very handy chart on there that talks about which plants perform best from transplants and which plants perform best from seed. So for example, you may have uh, lettuce, broccoli, and cabbage, cauliflower, etc. do really well from, from transplants, but you're going to want to maybe direct seed your carrots, your beans, uh, some of your onions, your uh, radishes, your winter peas, uh, and your turnip greens. You might direct seed those. So there's just a, uh, uh, you know, and then some can be either or, you know. So really like Swiss chard, you could direct seed it, you could transplant it, you know. So they're kale, same way. So there's a, a, a lot of different um, options there. So, and a, another thing you might try is starting your, your transplants inside. If you have 
one of those new new grow systems with LED lights to start seedling transplants of your vegetables. So you can buy your transplants or you can start your own. And the selection is much more limited when you're buying. You only have a limited amount of varieties you can choose from. So if you want to really get into it and have some of the more diverse and unusual vegetables, you're going to have to start your own. Yeah, I mean, I've found like literally any garden center that carries bonnie plants, probably going to have a decent little selection yeah. of those transplants, you know. You're not going to get anything fancy necessarily with Bonnie, but they're all pretty decent varieties that work. Yeah, I would say I would agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Ray, this is a great question. So get into this a lot. You know, if you get into Ray's bed gardening, especially, or if you've got a big area that you want to amend with that compost, it can actually get pretty expensive. Um, so what in your mind are some of the best free or low cost soil amendments and mulch ideas for, for newbie gardeners here in the panhandle? Sure. Home composting is a great way to produce a soil amendment. There should be a document coming in the chat about how to build your own uh, compost pile or bin. Um, but you can use some yard debris in that, such as grass clippings and leaves and uh, wood scraps from the yard. You know, that's kind of your browns, your, your carbon rich um, items. And then uh, greens like leftover vegetable garden material for the season or fruit and vegetable scraps from the kitchen combined and just sort of layer that in a pile or in a bin. Um, and over time, we'll make some pretty decent um, compost. Uh, it'll, it'll take a little time and it will definitely reduce in size over time as well. Um, but you wanna refrain from placing any kind of weeds or any oils or meats into that area either um, because um, you, know, you don't wanna weed farm, right? Growing out of your compost uh, bin. You do not. And um, the oils and meats are difficult really to break down um, in that situation and oftentimes invite unwanted pests. Um, so um, that's a great way to, uh, to kind of supplement your, your garden with some really good compost. Sometimes municipalities have chipping areas, um, possibly in your county, you may have that or, or a city or a town. Um, where there's a spot where they um, have a pile of shredded de debris um, that citizens can purchase for mulch, or it could be it could be free. Um, that's a that's an alternative there for mulch um, in your area, possibly. Uh, municipal wastewater plants sometimes have a product, and sometimes people feel funny about using something like that as compost. But oftentimes, um, you know, that's free or pretty cheap. But if you're a really small scale gardener. Um, you know, bags of mushroom compost and mulch from garden centers, um, probably not, not too bad on the old wallet. All right. I appreciate that, Ray. I'm really jealous of the municipalities like Tallahassee and some of the other areas that have free or, you know, very cheap compost in bulk that you can go get like at a landfill. We don't have that. So follow some of Ray's ideas there um, and you'll be well on your way. Matt, our final question here before we move on to some a little bit different topic, talking about some plant selection. How do you prepare the soil for the winter garden? And maybe touch on what you would do in a raised bed and what you might do sure. uh, if you're growing in the ground as well. Great, great idea. So uh, in a raised bed, what I would do is I would get some really good um, garden, high quality garden soil mix and put a new layer of soil on top of the existing soil if I've cleared out the bed already and and then uh, work in some before planting, work in some um, very low level fertilizer, organic fertilizer, like a 533 or a 362 or something like that with micronutrients. Uh, I like the ones that have uh, some of the soil microbes in, in the package, like the bacillus strains of soil microbes in the fertilizer so because your raised bed might not have the natural flora of soil microbes that your your garden would have so I like working that in um, a few days before even at such low nitrogen rate you could side dress uh, at planting even because it's a, like a three percent three to five percent nitrogen um, and then if you're doing a, a larger vegetable garden in the ground um, it would be a good idea to work in some organic matter three weeks ahead of time mm -hmm. in the form of compost or composted manure at a rate of 25 to 100 pounds of compost or composted manure per 100 square feet um, and work that in early. And then at planting time, you're going to rework the soil to, into a smooth, somewhat firm surface that still has some open areas for the seeds to go into. Uh, 
a lot of our Florida soils are poor in organic matter and organic matter not only helps hold water and give nutrients, but uh, can also help combat help uh, combat some root diseases as well. Uh, and make sure when you're applying organic matter, you're using composted uh, product. If you're using an uncomposted organic matter that has not been composted, such as chicken manure that's fresh, you need to wait a month or more before planting. Awesome. So thanks, Matt. Get that soil tilled up right, get it loose, get it fertile, and you'll be good to go. Appreciate that. So we're actually going to move a little bit to a slightly different topic. We're going to go into sort of uh, more plant selection, variety selection, and then some general planting tips. Um, and we're going to start here with Matt. This mm -hmm. is a great question. Matt, what temperatures signify the beginning, beginning of winter garden season? Oh, my gosh. That's a that's a good question. Um, I thought so. I call it fall winter. So in the fall time, I would, I'm a little early because last year it was a really hot September and I waited until October because it was too hot to really plant your fall and winter garden in September. This September, it seems a lot cooler. So I decided to take the plunge early when I started to see temperatures get down into the sixties at night. Yeah. Um, and that I was unexpected this last weekend, wasn't it? It was. And I saw that and I said, well, that might be might be okay to to get some winter winter plants out uh, to see those nighttime temperatures in the 60s, daytime in the 80s. Now I know we're going to have some hotter weather, and I talked it over with some master gardeners, and I and they said, well, what you might do with these transplants is if you do have a few hot days, is cut some of those uh, sable palm fronds that you have and you're growing all over your property, because I have a bunch of those that have come up over the years. And uh, cut those and and lay them on top of your your uh, winter vegetables to provide them some shade for a few days if, it, if the temperatures get above uh, ninety degrees or eighty eight degrees. And then when the temperatures cool back down, you just remove them. So that's a temporary shade idea. That so if you want to get your winter vegetables started early, but in general, nighttime temperatures in the sixties. The key is a nighttime temperature so they have a chance to cool off of the day as well. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And so, and Ashley might touch on this uh, next, maybe if, if she's next. Yeah. So, I mean, especially with stuff we were talking before we got on, like carrots and lettuce, you're you're just not going to get germination from those seeds if we're not in the 60s at night. So, definitely wait until we're consistently in the 60s. So, um, which which we're getting real close if we're not already there in some of these areas. So, all right, Ashley, your turn. There were so many questions very similar to the one that I'm about to ask you. So. Um, and the, the the question is, when is the best time to start planting a winter garden in Florida? And it's similar to Matt's question, but a little bit more nuanced. All right. So tag teaming off of what Matt said, I kind of call it a fall winter garden as well. I kind of combine the two seasons. And the biggest thing that's most important to consider is the varieties and what you're planting and the harvest time out. So you want something that's going to be within 60 days or less, so you don't get into um, the freezes of North Florida. So typically, like Matt said, the 60s at night, now is usually a good time. It's gonna be different every year, every season, you're kind of playing that game of putting them in too early and it gets too hot and putting them in too late and you get hit by a freeze. But those are kind of the things you wanna consider is how far out for your harvest day. Yep, correct. Very good. Thanks, Ashley. Ray, this is a question. Again, we got a bunch of variations on kind of the same theme here. And the question is, what are the best vegetables to grow in the fall? It's kind of what people came here for today. What are the best vegetables to grow in the fall, winter in Northwest Florida? Yeah, and that actually can be a pretty long list. That's a big um, question. If, if you think about it, I, I definitely refer everybody to, um, if you're not familiar with it, to the um, Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide. You can get that on PD and PDF um, online. We'll probably get a link to it here in the chat. That's a, a, a great reference to go to and um, check for uh, different um, varieties too that can grow that would grow well here in the in the Panhandle. But just starting off, um, leafy greens um, you can't go wrong there, right? The kale, mustard, yeah. turnip, collard greens, um, lettuce, and spinach um, all do well here in the Panhandle. Um, uh, as far as beans go, you can plant snap beans and pole beans. If I had a recommendation for you, try some Kentucky Wonder pole beans. You won't be uh, disappointed there. Um, and carrots and radishes, as we were talking about earlier um, in the group, uh, probably a, maybe now and a little bit uh, later, uh, maybe a better time to, to plant those too. 
Uh, but broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, all those uh, fall favorites um, definitely grow well here in the panhandle. Absolutely. Appreciate that, Ray. Um, Ashley, this is another very similar question. Um, you know, what are the best winter crops? So we, we talked about some of those in the fall there. Let's talk about some that you're, let's say we've missed, let, we, we're busy this fall and we miss our window and we don't really start getting our garden until after Thanksgiving, you know, when winter starts to set in December and January. Can we still plant then? And if so, what would you recommend for those later uh, in the year, early, early 2023 plantings when it's cold? Well, you're definitely going to want to consider plants that can handle a frost and a freeze because right. you're you're going to get to that window of harvest time during that period. So some of the ones um, that can handle more of the frost or freeze is going to be like your broccoli, um, sometimes Swiss chard. You do need to know if you get into those hard cold nights, some things may need to be covered. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few things you can do, but it's not as much if you can get started um, a little bit earlier than later. We do recommend that. Yeah. So I'll say a couple of things that I've had success in when I get a late start, you know, onions, a lot of times onion yeah. sets, well, and we're going to touch yeah. on they're, they're not even available, um, you know, until like November, December. So that's all right. Get those potatoes in. What is the traditional planting date? Like Valentine's Day, somewhere around there, you know, so if you miss some of this early stuff, you can definitely get potatoes in. And almost all the things that you can plant in the fall, uh, you know, you can plant again in the spring when the weather start to warm up just a tad. So, you know, if you miss if you miss uh, this opportunity here in the next couple of weeks, the next month, not all is lost. So I appreciate that, Ashley. Stephen, we come to you, my friend, in Santa Rosa <laughs> County. Uh, this is an awesome question. So again, lots of us don't have a huge area. You know, maybe we're down towards the beach, you know, where the lot sizes tend to be smaller, or we just want to grow in the patio. We don't want this huge garden. What vegetable varieties do you know if not better at least do really well um, in pots or smaller containers well uh, first i'll actually talk about the pots before i, I really would love for you to varieties. do that um you know there's there's such an array of different things you know you most of them you'll see out there are plastic formed and that kind which is mm -hmm. fine uh, but the real trick there is to make sure you're um, selecting a, a size that's appropriate for your need and setting and situation don't go out, go out and buy the uh, 30 gallon pot when you only need a, a one gallon or a two gallon size, you know, that, that can happen. But, um, um, and the other trick is make sure that there's quality drainage going out the base of the pot. It's amazing how quick something can fill up a small hole and suddenly you've got a puddle in there you're trying to grow in. A disaster. That can be a- <laughs> We've all done it. Frustrating. Yeah. Um, I, I tossed a pot just about a month ago that happened that way where the- yeah. The material inside just decomposed, broke down enough, and it clogged everything. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the other side of this, um, in terms of germination, which has been discussed, is, um, you know, you have to make a decision with containers. Are you going with a seed or are you going with a transplant? Yeah. Um, if you're kind of a beginning gardener, you may want to go and, like you guys talked about, you can go to any number of the, the garden centers and other places and find some good quality plants to use because you're looking at, at, contain, at plants that might range in terms of production value of between 35 and 90 days, depending on what you pick. So I'm gonna lead in with that. The 35 day cycle is where you're looking at the lettuces and the loose leaf lettuce and the bib lettuce and some of those things. Um, the loose leaf can start by seed, 35, 40 days, you, you're picking some nice things. Um, if you're looking at collards, I'd recommend transplants and start in the pot. Um, same thing with, um, this is kind of an unusual thing, but um, I'll usually start with some rosemary if I can get a nice plant or actually take a cutting off another one and start into a pot. Um, and I'll have it on wheels so I can move it around and get in a little more safe location if we have some extreme weather slip in on us from Canada. So yeah, yeah we like to um, pick off of that for some holiday cooking. Um, it does great with turkeys and other things we've got. Um, if you're looking at snap peas, you're looking at largely going in, planting with seed, bringing it up through. And what I talk about with that is figure out a way you're going to build a trellis system with that pot. How are you going to lead that snap, snap pea up so it's not just draping all over the place? But, you know, I've got bok choy, broccoli, uh, swift chard, um, even some of the mustard greens you can use, which I grew up with. Yep. <laughs> so that's just a few options. Awesome. So thanks, Stephen. So you got lots of options if you have a small space. So that's that's definitely heartening for us. And that can be a lot easier to take care of sometimes. Mm -hmm. so, you know, Agreed. 
if you know you're going to be busy traveling, you know, and just not going to have a ton of time to attend a big garden, maybe that's the way to go. So thanks, Stephen. I, I really appreciate it. Ashley, I'm about to ask you a question about something that I cannot answer because I do not like this particular vegetable. Uh, what is your favorite beet variety? Beets are nasty and you shouldn't grow them, but if you do, what variety should they grow? I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Yes, I also do not eat beets. I can't tell you I have a favorite, <laughs> but what I can tell you is the best that grow here in Florida. So some good variety of beets to do would be Solyndra, Detroit Dark Red, Early Wonder, Tall Top, and Yellow Detroit. Works for me. Anybody else got any more beet suggestions that you've grown before? Hearing none, we will move on. So thanks, Ashley, for those beet varieties. Um, and we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but the next question is, can you plant uh, some of these bulbing winter vegetables? Uh, can you plant garlic and onions here in the panhandle in the wintertime? Yes, and like you said, you kind of touched on it already. Um, you can do garlic and onions. Um, garlic's gonna be much later. Onions is usually between um, October and mid-November, and then um, onion, garlic's gonna come at the end. Garlic needs six to eight weeks of um, cool weather in order to um, be able to do anything. Yeah, I like growing both of these. I particularly like growing onions. Um, any of those, you know, short, uh, you know, those yellow granex types work really good. Um, you know, we can't call them Vidalia onions because we're not in that 16 county region in Georgia, as Ray, <laughs> Ray could probably tell us he's a bulldog. Uh, we'll, we'll forgive that. But if you're not in the Vidalia growing region, you can't call them Vidalias, but essentially that's what you're growing and those varieties do great. I love growing garlic, you know, um, if you're going to grow it, might want to save back some of those bulbs every year so you have some more to put out, but garlic is super easy too. Um, Stephen, we're coming back to you in Santa Rosa County. This question specifically asked about North Santa Rosa County, but maybe just touch on the entire panhandle too. Um, what's some of your favorite broccoli varieties to grow uh, here in the panhandle and then specifically in your county over there uh, at Santa Rosa? Well, you've got the old standard, the Pac-Man that's, that's been out there for I don't know how many decades. A long time. You know, a long, long cycle. It's the same way you lead back to, um, you know, when you're thinking about broccoli and in, in, in this area, it depends on where you are in parts of the county. Are you coastal or are you way up on the Alabama line like Santa Rosa County? That's 74, 75 miles difference. And, For sure. uh, and so, you know, first thing off, I'd say plant now or plant like Matt said last week. Um, you want to get that in the ground and up, but there's a, there's another one called early dividend. There's one that's an early green and, and there's, there's a number of different selections out there. Um, once in a while, you'll see some in the garden center that you just don't know what that variety is, but you know, it's worth a try. I'd, I'd buy a pack of it and put it out and see how it turns out and see how the head production is. And, you know, there's a certain level of sugar levels in the, in broccoli, even though we don't think about it. Um, it really changes the taste and flavoring of it. So okay. you know, just keep in mind about the frost and it's very tolerant to that, but freeze can be an issue. One of the things that I like to do with all of these different vegetable varieties, as far as mixing it up is I'm a, I, you know, not, not going to necessarily plug one company over another or anything like that, as far as seed sources go. But if you keep up with Johnny seeds at all, just every, every year, um, hit up their website in the fall and see what's new and try that. So that's a way to keep things fresh and grow a little bit different variety here and there. So yeah, that's I, like, I, I like Johnny's. It's a, yeah. it's a good, it's a good operation. Yep. Um, and this is an interesting question, Ray. Um, you know, we're uh, actually in tomato season right now for, for our commercial growers, our fall tomato season. So we'll go ahead and touch on this. When should you plant tomatoes outside and are we too late right now? Well, we're a little past. I'd say we're right on the edge though. Yep. Um, if you're planting transplants, you'd be you'd probably be <laughs> okay. If you're in a, if you plant them in a container, yeah. that you can move. Yep. I see Matt shaking his head. What do you think, Matt? Yeah. <laughs> if you're going to plant them in a container. Quickly, Matt, what, you, what what's the look for? I think it's way too late for tomatoes because of all the lovely pests we have in the fall that love to feed on them. Yeah. And, and at, in, in the setting, you know, you're going to get into, it'll get too cool for them to set fruit too. So uh, before it freezes. So um, all right. 
Uh, you have I to, think that unless you have a special one like that does well in Ohio or something. Uh, <laughs> All right. That, that's enough. what I think. Fair enough. So you're both right, I think. So you, you can still do it. The degree of difficulty going to be higher. You know, so just know that. And if you're going to do it at all, containers the way to go. All right. Thanks for that. Um, Matt, since since uh, since you're on a roll here, I'm sure. going to ask I'm going to ask you about succession sowing with seeds. So, oh, that's cool. I love that one. Yeah. Tell and, us a little bit about succession planting and can succession. you do it for broccoli in particular? Yes, you can. So what I'd like to also touch on is if you're if you're into planting different things, you know, we have we didn't touch on this, but we have parsley, cilantro, uh, chives and thyme, which will do well in the winter, too. So all of those herbs are really great for winter gardening. For sure. Um, but also uh, with succession planting, for example, what I've done is I have some peppers that I planted back in, in, in the summer that are just producing. And they're going to continue to produce until the temperatures get too cool for fruit set around October, end of October. So I interplanted some radish seeds in there. So whenever those radish seeds come up, I'll have very nice radishes. So when it's time to cut down the peppers, there'll be something there already grow, growing. So that's one thing about succession planting is you can intercrop uh, some of the leftover or still doing well summer vegetables with your fall vegetables and you don't necessarily have to clean out the bed right away. The next thing for, for succession planting, I provided a document is say for broccoli, every seven to 21 days, you are planting a new crop um, of, of, of that of that vegetable you're succession planting. So your site like for radishes or broccoli, you're seeding new seeds in every seven to 21 days so that you will have a steady harvest. That's really good for cauliflower because uh, broccoli sometimes will produce a second crop on the stock where cauliflower will not. So uh, that's a good idea. If, if you're starting your own transplants, you can succession start transplants every seven to 21 days and then plant them out in the garden as necessary. So succession planting, all that is is planting at different, the same vegetable crop at different times throughout the season so that you get a, a harvest throughout the season as well. Yeah, so I've definitely never done it with broccoli, but I've had pretty good success with like lettuce and some of those leafy greens right. that Stephen and Ray were talking about, you know, like every two weeks, something like that, you know. Yeah, that's exactly bit. right. It's it's a really great way to extend your harvest season. And we're and about to hit have... season extension here in a big way in just a second, so sure. stay tuned on that. Um, I'm just going to ask Stephen this question. So Stephen, um, to hit this sort of maximum uh, little planting window that we like in the fall, um, mm -hmm. how many weeks would you say that you have to plant before, you know, to still get a crop in before those, you know, freezes start to happen? Well, that's a, that's a loaded question all around. Isn't it, it is. Um, because, it, you know, again, what I mentioned earlier is depending on where you're located, how close are you to the coastline and the water and the moderate temperatures impact, impacted by that, or you at I-10 and north and having those a little more of a temperature swing between that, that's really going to play into that question. So um, <laughs> I don't have a good answer, I guess, is the best way to say it. You know, I'd say anytime, I'll just throw kind of a general general thing out. If you get your seeds in anytime over the next six or seven weeks, you're probably going to be okay. Sometime between now and the 1st of November is yeah. kind of when it, I would ideally and start. And it, it just comes down to the what you're selecting. If you're trying yep. to start with broccoli seed, uh, it's going to be a little bit tight. And they're getting yep. to that late December cycle when that head's about ready. And suddenly we have an Arctic blast come down. But if it's lettuce or some of those quick ones in those 30 to 45, 50 day cycles, yeah. Go for it. You got time. Yeah. So our classic garden in the panhandle live answer, it depends. So, <laughs> so um, Stephen, while we're talking to you here, could, uh, could you give the this next Zoom listener a little information about seed saving? So can you save seeds from these vegetables to plant for the next season? Um, you can certain seeds. Are you talking cool season? Or are you talking about warm season? Uh, we're talking these cool season plants. So we plant okay. here the next six, eight weeks. And then when they get done, you know, we're going to let them flower out. Can we save those seeds for next winter? Um, some of the ones, some of the lettuces are a bit challenged because a small okay. seed and doesn't have yeah. that much food storage inside the seed itself. Some of the yeah. larger ones, um, you might be able to save your broccoli. I've done that. Now, you know, you have to bear in mind your germination percent is going down. Sure basically might as well cut it in half, but you Ziploc it in a tight container system and put it in, I typically like to put it in the door of the freezer, not deep okay. into the freezer and just keep it there. 
Um, if you have questions, and let's say you have 200 seed or something, you can pull out um, some and do a germination test by putting them on a damp paper towel, put them in a Ziploc container and just keep them on a, a well-lit area and check them in a couple of weeks and see how many you have germinate out of that group of 10, Absolutely. 12, well, 10 or 20 in the group. Yeah. Pretty simple. So good answer. Yeah. Steve. I appreciate it. So now I'm going to pitch a question to everybody that Miss Clara Mullins from over there in Leon County asked us your favorite veggie to grow uh, in the cool season. And Stephen, again, since you were just talking, we're going to start with you and I'll rotate around my screen. So favorite veggie to grow and do not say rosemary. It's not a vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had to throw that one in there, by the way. But um, it, uh, you know, honestly, I like the uh, menagerie of different lettuce mixes and things, you know, with a little bit of the sweet or mild and a little bit of the bitter in it. That it just adds a little bit of uniqueness, uniqueness I can use in a lot of different dinner plates and things. Stephen is and, our resident renaissance man, so there you go. I will throw some bok choy in there when I'm doing something a little bit different. Feeling a little frisky, get that bok choy in there. Ray, yeah. what's your favorite winter veggie to grow? Oh, I got to say turnips. You know, I'm from South oh. Georgia. We're all about turnips. Man. Yeah, the right. roots, the leaf, everything. That's fall to me. Yeah, okay. I'm not, I am, I, you know, born and raised in the very deep South here, but not a, not a greens person. I know I'm not a good Southerner. So Matt, favorite winter veggie to grow? Radishes and their relatives. I love the different types, the daikons, the icicle, the cherry bell, the watermelon radish. There's so many different and unusual forms and tastes there so i really like radishes nice good answer ashley you know what's coming to you favorite winter veggie to grow i'm with steven i like the mix of lettuces especially the the red um, lettuce and i like swiss chard as well all right so those of you that gave me lettuce as a whole i'm gonna make you nail it down give me give me a variety or two that you just really like steven and ashley i don't have one <laughs> um, sometimes sometimes it's whatever I can um, scrounge and find. Fair enough. Ashley, you got one that you just really like? I don't have a variety of lettuce, but the Swiss chard, I really like the peppermint um, okay. Swiss chard. It's really pretty okay. red and white and looks nice in the garden um, during right. the wintertime. That's I'll, pretty cool. I will tell you my wife likes bib lettuce because it's very mild, and she wraps yeah. things, uses it as a wrap to eat with oh. instead of eating with bread. Okay, very good. So I'll give mine. I see Mark Tansik said spinach, oak leaf, lettuce, collards, mustards. I it's it's a wonderful thing. I ask people to give their favorite one favorite vegetable, and Mark gives us four. That's that's classic. Um, so for me, it's going to be onions. Again, that yellow granite type. I like to plant them in November, uh, harvest them. You know, late April, middle of May, somewhere in there. And then the wonderful part about onions. They store really well. I harvest my onions. I got onions the whole rest of the year. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. So get those onions planted for sure. Um, and so now we're going to move a little bit to season extension and crop protection here. Um, Matt Orwat, this is a great question that everybody wants to know the answer to. How can we extend our garden's yield uh, time? So take that yield time that it normally is, maximize it over a longer period. How can we do that? Well, we already talked about succession planting, so I'm not going to go into that again. But that would be I, a way, right? I posted the link, yeah. yeah. But then I, I, now I finally realized what you meant there. So, so that would be to uh, low tunnel, uh, low tunnel um, with some frost cloth. If you you could buy the the little hoops online and and some frost cloth sometimes, either online or your local nursery, and just uh, installing that over your winter vegetables through December and January when there's some of the coldest weather that could will definitely reduce your your kills from freezes and you'll get a a, a, a faster a faster crop of of uh, a faster production in february if you do that if you do that through december and january awesome uh, for example um also you can extend your your season uh with some of those um you can also start planting your spring vegetables earlier if you use that system as well Okay, so Stephen, on the on the subject of of low tunnels and season extension and crop protection, tell us a little bit about hoop houses. I know that some I've actually got a couple of gardeners here that have gotten into it in a big way in Calhoun County, um, and love the the hoop house for their garden. How successful are the use of hoop houses for growing warm season crops throughout the winter? Um, again, you I, more have to defend def, define what you're you're looking at in a hoop house. Um, you know, is it is it a low hoop house where you're you're covering with a plastic cover, or is it one that's more of a commercial grade with the big pipe and you know framed in, and actually you can almost drive a small lawnmower through it type thing. Yeah. 
But, uh, you know, when you're looking at warm season crops, I get real nervous about recommending that when you get into the winter cycle. And there's mm -hmm. several reasons. It's not just the temperature, but it's the light. Yeah. Um, are you getting enough of that in a given day or extended periods of time to really produce a decent crop? And so that, for my typical answer is high risk and I don't recommend it. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, but if, if you're willing to make the dive in, um, you know, make sure you're venting it well on those warm days and battening down the hatches on it on those cold, cold evenings. Gotcha. Appreciate that, Stephen. Um, Matt, coming back to you. Uh, so this is an interesting question. So how to combat the intense Florida sun on your winter garden? And I think this is going to be an interesting answer. Does do vegetables really need protection from the sun? That's that's a really that's a really good question. Um, I posted a link for y'all called Vegetables Made for Shade, so you can delve into that. Mm -hmm. It talks a lot about, you know, shade cloth and stuff. But but really for winter vegetables, I would say the only time your your vegetables would need any type of shade covering in the winter, because we already have reduced sunlight in the winter. So it's the answer is really no. Yeah. But bingo. If you have some, if you have some new transplants and you have a hot spell in September or early yeah. October where it's getting hot, you could put some shade on them for a couple of days. That's about it. Okay. Um, that's and you could, you know, I like I said, get some sable palm fronds and throw them on top, and then take them off when it's finished. Uh, when the hot time's gone. Uh, now for summer vegetables, you know, I, I strategically planted my peppers in an area that gets afternoon shade from a building. It mm -hmm. still gets about nine to ten hours of full sun. But then starting around two to four o'clock, it starts getting a little shade from that building and they tend to do a little better. But when it comes to winter, I would say really not necessary. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, here in the end of September, we definitely have some days that can, you know, hit up into the 90s and it can be an issue. But once we get past that, you know, we're just the, mo the more light we can get, the better. You know, we're fighting to get enough light. Yeah, a lot and if you're in South Florida, it's a different answer. Totally different here in the Panhandle, though. So we want that full sun, especially in the wintertime. Steven, another interesting question. One thing people like or don't like about Florida, that is, you know, they always say, uh, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes and it'll change. So the question here is, how do you combat the ever-changing temperatures in the winter? <laughs> um, in the Southeast, that's a loaded question. You know, ahead of these cold fronts, we'll be 80s during the day, and then cold front roll through that night, you'll be in the 30s. How do you deal with that? I, well, ask, I guess we should actually ask the question of the people in the orange production, that question. <laughs> um, because you, you think about it years ago, and it was in the 80s, orange production was way north of Orlando to a Canadian cold front blew in and suddenly went, like you're talking about, from those 80-degree days down to 2021 at night. That just blew yep. those things apart. Um, you know, you, when you're looking at how do you manage it, you can manage some of the cooler cycles, um, you know, by structure, you know, or yep. do you have a greenhouse in place? Um, do you have a way you can move your plants like container plants and other things away from the cold spot, get them covered? Um, I've watched my neighbors and I've tried to go out and recommend to them not doing this. They'll drop plastic over top of some of the plants. And you know right. what plastic will do when it touches, it's a nice vector for that cold coming straight through. Yes, sir. Plus it catches too much moisture under there and you have dripping and everything else. So, um, I used to, my grandmother, I used to take, help her take out the old blankets from out of the closet and go out and cover parts of her vegetable garden when those weather tents were moving around. So, you know, you don't think about it, but a blanket might give you that two degrees you need just to protect that plant just enough to get through. There you go. Yeah, so one thing that I always found interesting when, uh, you know, people move down here from the north, they're talking about these, our winter vegetables are things in some of the northern states that you can kind of grow throughout the summer, you know, so right. a lot of times when we get into those 80s, that's their high temperatures in the summer. So we're not concerned with that warm weather, like Stephen mentioned, we're concerned with, with that really cold. Um, and kind of along those lines, Stephen, we're going to go straight into, uh, should you think about producing uh, vegetables in a little hobby greenhouse during the winter? Um, and if so, what would be some tips you would offer for that? Well, I think that would be a great thing to consider. Um, there are a lot of greenhouses online that you can order and assemble yourself, or if you, you are so inclined, you can hire somebody to build one, or you can literally just build one out of structure material you have. But, um, you know, in the winter, um, a hobby greenhouse is an excellent way to go. Um, you can keep it in containers or if you're actually growing in the ground, you can do that. But, um, 
you know, the, the question comes to you got to make sure you're venting it properly. Um, is there a fan system? Is it automated? Is it manual? Do you travel a lot and not get back to it? It can turn into a sweat house inside that greenhouse. And then you've got, you've got a great breeding ground if, if you want to collect disease samples and things. Um, you know, you'll have a lot of mildew issues and other things pop up. So on those warm days, if you know it's warming up in the day, you may want to make sure the door's open and, and the, the vents are open to where you can get air movement through it. Um, you can build these. Um, I've built my own greenhouses over the years using some yep. of the, the hardy plastic materials like you see on greenhouse production site areas. I've used 40. Um, I've, I've used the um, PVC 40 gauge with the UV protected. Yeah. Um, I've used metal tubing. That's a trick there. You got to build your own structure, how to bend the poles. So that, yeah. that takes a little bit of time. For sure. Um, uh, but, you know, you know, the, you can build the baseboards and lift it up, and put the poles on it. So you can have a walk-in friendly one, seven feet tall. And I picked up some fans from uh, a local outfit with a, actually I used an um, attic thermostat, which wasn't great, but it worked well enough. So, you know, there are ways to really use that. Um, hobby greenhouse for a lot of different things in vegetable production winter and fall in the shoulder seasons. Okay. Very good. Thanks, Stephen. Ashley, we think about this next question a lot with things like tomatoes. We start our seeds inside in January and to then set them out, you know, the late March, something like that. But can you do the reverse with winter seeds, start them indoors to get an early start outside? So, and if so, when should they be started indoors for things like collards, lettuce, arugula, cabbage, those winter leafy greens? Um, if you're starting anything inside, it usually needs to be four to six weeks before you plant it into the garden. Um, with a lot of these, honestly, because we're already, um, you want it to be the cooler nights. I don't know if doing it inside early is going to help you. Right. So I would be planting most of these by, by seed directly into the garden. Um, yeah. I think in the summer, it's more important to get a head start. You can plant those summer crops inside and get them out after that last freeze. But in the winter, I don't know it's as necessary. Right. And if if you were going to do that, you've kind of missed your chance. So you were saying if we subtract back four to six weeks, that gets us back first or second week, August there, something like that. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Thank you. Good answer. I appreciate it. Ray, coming to you down in Gulf County. Uh, this is a great question. We get every winter, January, February, especially when they get these cold fronts rolling through. Do I need to cover my plants, my winter vegetables in case of a freeze? Um, or can I just mulch around them? What are some of the, we've talked about this a little bit, but specifically in the case of a freeze, how would you handle your winter? Mulch is good. Yeah, you can definitely cover plants um, with a, a visqueen or um, even blankets if it comes to that point. Um, I can say, I know we're talking about vegetables, but if you have young citrus trees too um, on your property, it's good to cover them as well until they're more established, maybe a few years uh, established where they can maybe combat some of these more uh, cooler temperatures. Okay, awesome. Stephen, we get... Uh, folks talk about microclimates and I picked you for this question because I've you know I, you're one of those coastal counties that has kind of extremes in, very, in, in weather from top to bottom so how do I know what microclimate my yard might have and how uh, would I prepare you know plants for those microclimates? Wow that's a loaded question. Thanks. <laughs> I give you the hard ones. <laughs> um, microclimates you know that's it can be defined in all kinds of ways. Um, it can be the shadow of the house creates a microclimate. It's a more northern facing. It's going to have those cooler summers, a little bit more moisture than expected. Um, so that that can be a part of it. Is it square out in the backyard where you're getting that intensive sun and heat up and then cool down during the nighttime mm -hmm. or extremes? All that's going to play into it. Um, you know, it, it's more experience watching what you've had out there. And then planning me, for that. Yeah. Trial, and er, trial and error has been the best lesson for me, to be quite honest. <laughs> yeah. One of those oops, oops moments. Well, I won't do that again. Definitely. Um, you know, another microclimate I talk about is deer populations. Oh, okay. Think about that. If yeah. that's a pattern where they're strolling through a certain area of your yard, that may not be the best place for a vegetable garden. Man, that's, I had deer eat the tops out of my onions last year. I guess they were really hungry. I'd never seen that before. Uh, last winter, they were eating everything that can move. Yeah, they, for sure. Couldn't move, I should say. That's right. That's right. All right. Thanks, Stephen. Matt or what? We're going to switch gears and talk about veggie garden maintenance here for our last few minutes. Um, 
we know watering is super important in Florida in the summer, but the question here is how often should I water uh, the winter garden? You're muted, Matt. That's a great question, Daniel. So what? I thank you. I appreciate that. Well, thank you. I didn't come up with it. I just read them. I, I, yeah. Well, I like that question. I found, you know, our, our very own Evan Anderson in Walton County had a really has posted a really good article on guarding the panhandle about that, and and he was mentioning in a St. Augustine lawn can can really take a hit if without without water in that summer if 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 at all if a St. Augustine lawn is without water for five days it can take a hit, but in the winter time, it can be without water from eight to twenty-eight days without taking a hit. So uh, that that's when talking about a lawn, but for a vegetable garden, it's actively growing and trying to produce a, a crop like a some type of fruit uh, on it, like you know, or a, a, a leaf that that you want to harvest, or a, you know, a, or even a flower structure you want to harvest, like a broccoli. So you are responsible for keeping it watered well enough. If you're not getting the rains, if we're not getting enough rains, uh, you should go out there and touch your soil to make sure it's moist and doesn't go dry. You don't want it sopping wet, but you don't want it dry. So check that. If it's not raining, check that garden three times a week for watering, I would say, if it's not raining. If we're getting good rains, then you're probably good without having to check for watering. But if we're having a dry spell in the wintertime, check that garden three times a week to make sure it, it's getting the adequate watering. And if you're doing transplants or you have seedlings coming up in September, you need to check it every day because those seedlings can dry out quickly. That's very especially quickly. important. Yeah, when you're trying to start from seed, it's got to be consistently moist. So that's very critical. But carrots too. You. Carrots too. Yeah. Good job, Matt. Uh, so Stephen, coming back to you for this next question. So what pests and diseases do you need to look out for uh, in the winter garden? In my experience, it's a lot less than in the summer, but are there some key ones that you may run into? I mean, it's significantly less. If if you're yeah. in a in a covered situation where you you kind of have a warmer or humid site area, you start mm -hmm. looking for aphids and some of those. And um, you know, there's not a whole lot of what I call chewing insects out there doing a lot of work. It, you know, they're they've kind of packed it in for the winter. Now, once in a while, you will get a a moth emerge and lay some eggs in there, and you'll you'll get a couple of loopers and some other things in there chewing on the edges of of things, but I, I really don't worry too much about it during the winter period. I'm sure not going to go in and spray insecticides that often. No, not, not I can count it. the number of times I've had to spray for insects in the winter on one hand, you know, it's just not as bad in the winter. So I love to garden in the winter. Weather's much better, lots fewer bugs. You know, it's a great. So actually, this is an interesting question I've never really thought about before. Can you eat root vegetables, you know, your carrots, uh, your turnips or things like that that have been damaged by root knot nematodes? Yes, the oh, easy answer is deal. yes, absolutely. But right. I will say your um, carrots, your root vegetables, they will be ugly. They could be distorted. They could have tough galls, thick skin. Um, root knot nematodes will reduce your yield, but the flavor does not change. You can still eat them. All right, fair enough. Probably can't sell them if you're a commercial grower, but if you're a backyard grower, go for it. I like it. So Matt, uh, we just talked about with Stephen, there's a lot fewer bugs in the winter, but what are some strategies just to repel those bugs and keep them away well, from our winter vegetables? Well, uh, for example, and bugs and fungal diseases. So we, we could get some powdery mildew on some of our lettuce crops. Sure. So the thing is to make sure there's plenty of good air circulation in your planting. They're not planted too close together because I've seen powdery mildew on your, your greens, your lettuce crops, and maybe even broccoli. Um, so that's one of the probably about the only fungal pest that I've seen in the winter. Uh, but when it comes to uh, insects, you know, you might see some white flies or aphids, or not too really too many. But if you're really concerned about it, there is uh, you can buy this uh, this micro insect netting. I bought some for tomatoes when I grew them this spring to exclude insects. And you can put that around your beds to ex exclude uh, insects. You can find it online. It's a it's a netting that even excludes small spider mites and aphids. And you could uh, put that around your bed on with some stakes that hold it up above your your crops. And it really doesn't take it. It's it's fine enough to filter out insects. It doesn't really block enough sun to make a difference that in that regard. So that's a way to exclude them. But really. Uh, when it comes to insect pests, if you have a few white flies or aphids, uh, an easy spray of insecticidal soap would get rid of them. And I've really never had 
too many problems with insects in the in the winter time. It's the wonderful do, part I, about the winter garden. But the main thing with powdery mildew on, I think last year I had some issues with kale, uh, and it didn't make it ugly. So just keep an eye out for powdery mildew. All right. So moving to Ashley. Ashley, people are getting into growing cover crops in their garden. I've done a good bit of that. You know, if you have a huge garden, so let's say you've got what's a good ground cover for a bed or an area of your garden that you're not going to use for veggies this winter. Well, I took this question as is cover crop because when I think of ground I crops, too. I think of something that would be in the ground more than just a season. Correct. I think a cover crop's a really great idea if you're not doing winter gardening or if you're rotating your um, crops and not using an area of the garden. Some good winter ones, um, some are more ground cover than others. Some are going to be taller. Or some of your clovers, your crimson clover, um, hairy vetch, um, lupin, a winter rice, a uh, popular one. And uh, some of the farmers even do um, some of your grains, your oats and stuff. Yeah. So I'm always going to lean on the side of those legumes that Ashley mentioned. Because they just put that nitrogen back in the soil and reduces the amount of fertilizer you have to put out. I actually did this last year. Had great luck with that crimson clover that she talked about. So I wound up not really having to fertilize my tomatoes that I planted behind it at all because they dumped that nitrogen back into the soil. So perfect, Ashley. I appreciate that. Um, this is an interesting question. Um, any, I'm just going to give this to the group. All right, we've done the green industry best management practices, you know, as far as, you know, water quality, fertility, things like that. And so are there any specific green industry best management practices to use in the winter garden planning? You know, we have these high rainfall events with those cold fronts. What impact should that have, uh, you know, on your, your, your planting and your maintenance? So I'll just throw it out to the group. I'm going to throw back, throw back an answer. All right, let's hear it quickly. Uh, I would say use a slow release, low nitrogen fertilizer, particularly in an organic matter form that's been composted or in a pellet by, made by some of the organic fertilizer companies. Uh, that way, if we have a cold front and the water's dumped, you still have uh, nutrients tied up in the soil there that'll continue to be released slowly. Wonderful answer. Steven, you got anything to add? The other side of that, he just touched around the edge of it, Matt did. He did. And that's the organic matter. You know, we have these deep sandy soils. Make sure you got something that can create a retention site area. Yeah, I usually like to look at about two percent organic matter in a in a format in that six inch soil to hold a lot of things there. Perfect. Y'all hit both sides of that. Exactly what I was hoping you would do. All right. So Stephen, talking about that fertility, we know that winter plants and summer plants, you know, you know, our needs are a little bit different. So how often would you suggest fertilizing these winter veggie gardens, and is it different than your summer garden? Uh, it is different because the, uh, the the releases are a lot slower. Um, so I, I tend to want to go the way Matt just mentioned about a little bit of a combination material that's that tends to release it in a time manner, um, depending on moisture availability, light, temperature, those kinds of things. So look at some of those. Uh, they are a little more expensive fertilizers. It's not your typical basic garden fertilizer that releases all in a matter of two or three weeks. Right. And then you have to figure out what am I doing next? Uh, yeah. The other option is if you've got a small enough setting is using some of those liquid uh, mm -hmm. fertilizers and apply it directly to the leaf surface areas and, and manage it that way. Okay, very good. So I got the last two questions. We're almost done. We've got a minute or two left. So thanks everybody for hanging in here with us. We've got two questions left. I'm going to throw out to the group. So the first one is, could y'all talk about some organic, natural, uh, more natural type controls and repellents uh, to use? You know, we don't, we know that a lot of these leafy vegetables are growing directly from the garden into the salad, you know, something like that. We don't necessarily want to eat our pesticides. So talk about just some organic and more natural options uh, if we needed some pest control. There's, there's plenty of, plenty of products on the market for insecticidal soap and horticulture oils that okay. are organic and safe to use on vegetable crops. Uh, that's what I would start with. Okay. Anybody else? Um, diatomaceous earth might be in a certain yeah. situation. Sure. Especially if you're dealing with something like aphids or very small soft-bodied insects. Yeah. Yep. Rub across it. That's it. And that's tough for them. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Ashley. I like to teach on companion planting. So oh, yeah. planting yeah. Um, other um, plants that will actually attract those insects from what you're actually growing and trap cropping is a good one too. Okay. And we're going to sign off with this last question. I want all of you, I know some of you have trouble with directions. One, give me one, give me your best winter gardening tip. One, just the one. Steven, best give winter gardening tip to leave us with. 
advice to my neighbor and help him grow his. Okay. <laughs> All right. Ray, Stephen is not wanting to grow his garden. He's wanting to teach his neighbor how to grow so he will share with him. Ray, what is your tip? Your best I winter? like that. I like that. Don't yeah. forget the water. Okay. Don't forget the water. Don't forget the water. Yes. Matthew. Keep an eye on your moisture. I like it. Plant in succession. Plant in succession so it doesn't all come in at one time. Ashley. Visit the garden often so you can catch those uh, insects and pest disease issues early. Love it. And I want to violate the rules. Don't grow tomatoes. <laughs> so, talking about the winter. I specifically told you one thing and it was related to the winter and you can't Don't do it. grow tomatoes. <laughs> Don't. Okay. All right. So I thank everybody for attending today on our winter gardening. Please, please, please fill out our survey. It greatly helps us uh, develop what we want to do. Tune in next month for our last uh, Gardening in the Panhandle Live for 2022. It's hard to believe 2022 is almost over. We're in the fourth, beginning the fourth quarter here. Wild stuff. So that's going to be on gardening myths. Uh, so that and home remedies as well. So that'll be super interesting. If you've always had that garden myth, you're not sure if it's true or not. Uh, be sure to tune in, ask that question. Or if you've got a home remedy idea for us that you want our opinions on what the research says, be sure to ask it then. Until then, thank you to Stephen, Ray, Matt and Ashley and all our folks behind the scenes uh, for today's event. We will see you in October for Gardening the Panhandle Live. Y'all have a lovely afternoon.